challenges in our lives. And uh, sometimes we can be feeling up, sometimes we can, can be feeling down. Our circumstances can change, but no matter how we are feeling, because we are followers of Christ, followers of the way, we are told to bring our praise to God. And from Psalm 113, we read, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And that's what we're here to do this morning. Let's commit our time unto the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we come to you, and Lord, you know our hearts. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Lord, you have drawn us together as a body of your people. And Lord, you know our hearts. You know all we're going through. And Lord, sometimes we may be walking through a dark valley. Sometimes we may be walking on the mountainside. And yet, Lord, there is never a time and never a season never a circumstance, that you are not with us. So, Lord, this morning, wherever our hearts lie, we pray that you would lift them before you, that we would sing your praise, that we would lift our hearts in prayer before you, that we would hear and receive your holy word. And, Lord, as we come to an end of our time and go forth into another week, May we go knowing that we have met with you, that you have strengthened, nourished, and encouraged us for another week ahead as we seek to follow your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Jane to lead us again in praise. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Steve. Let's sing our first song. We have such a need of the Lord in these times, don't we? Oh, Lord, the clouds are gathering, the fire of judgment burns. How oh, we have fallen, oh, Lord. You stand appalled to see our rows of love so scorned and life so broken. Have mercy, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Restore us, Lord. Revive your church again. Let justice flow like rivers. And righteousness like a never failing spring. Oh Lord, over the nations now, where is the God of peace? The wings are broken. Oh Lord, while precious children star, the tools of war increase. Their bread is stolen. Have mercy, Lord, forgive us, Lord, restore us, Lord, revive your church again. Let justice flow like rivers and righteousness like a never failing stream. Cause our boys to flood our streets with hate and fear. We must awaken, oh Lord. Let love reclaim the life that sin would sweep away. And let your kingdom come. Have mercy, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Restore us, Lord, revive your church again. Let justice flow like rivers and righteousness.
righteousness like a never failing stream. Yet, oh Lord, your glorious cross shall talk triumphant in this land. Suffering church display the glories of the Christ. Praises resounding. Have mercy, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Restore us, Lord. Revive your church again. Let justice flow like rivers. And righteousness like a never failing stream, a never failing stream. Oh, breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. Oh, breath of life, come cleanse, renew us, and fit your church to meet this all. Oh, breath of love, come breathe within us, renewing thought and will and Love of Christ and fresh to win us. Revive your church in every call. Oh, wind of God, come bend us, break us till humbly we confess our need. In your tenderness, remake us, revive, restore, for this we plead. Revive us, Lord, is zeal abating, while harvest steals are fast and dry. Revive us, Lord, the world is waiting. Equip your church to spread the land. Lord, we need you. We need you to come. We need your Holy Spirit. Breathe on us, Lord. Breathe on me, 
Jane for those well thought out pieces and leading us in that time of praise. On being asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Quoting two passages from the Torah, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 and Leviticus 19 verse 18, Jesus summarizes the whole law and the prophets. In other words, what it is vital to have in order to be a follower of the way. In breaking these two commandments, we are sinning both against God and against our neighbor. Ultimately, all sin is against God, but usually it is manifested as sin against our neighbor. So we're going to confess our sin before God. Hopefully there will be some words on the screen. So let us just take a moment to allow God's Spirit to search our hearts and to show what we need to confess before him. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together we say, O God, our loving Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you, we have broken your commandments. We have often been selfish. We have not loved you as we should. For these and all our sins, forgive us, we pray. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we confess in faith, we receive the assurance of God's forgiveness. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are now going to hear God's word, and I'm going to invite Pamela to bring us this morning's reading. Thank you, pa Pamela. You need to unmute, Pamela. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, a prophecy, Nahum chapter one, a prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkazite, the Lord's anger against Nineveh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. 
His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises, devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you more. Now I will break their yoke. Yes. From your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your ground, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vow. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pamela, for that reading. Thank you. Now, uh, some preachers uh, can be given the um, blame for always choosing very familiar passages. This is something that cannot be said about Philip because he chooses some of the most obscure passages. But of course, um, all scripture is God breathed, and it's good to look at these more unfamiliar passages and to hear what the Lord has to say through us. So, Philip, it's over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. What an introduction. It is a joy, of course, to seek the whole counsel of God. And if we are not reading the whole of the scriptures, then there is a serious risk we're going to go awry at some point. Here we've got what a lot of people might consider to be a difficult passage. The prophet Nahum pronounces a prophecy, or in some of the translations it's an oracle, concerning Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. He's writing in the 7th century BC, so that means 600 years plus before Jesus was born. And he's writing at a time when Nineveh is still in existence, but it is in a relatively short space of time going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed by Babylon and the powers that are allied with Babylon. For over 200 years by this point, Assyria has brutally ruled its subject peoples and it struck fear into all of the surrounding nations. One of the countries which has suffered under the Assyrian attack and the Syrian yoke is the northern Israelite kingdom of Israel. That was invaded in 772 BC, so before Nahum is preaching. Its capital Samaria was destroyed. Its people were deported, taken into captivity, um, spread around the Assyrian Empire, and new people brought into that land from elsewhere in the uh, Assyrian Empire. And it's that mixture of people that gave us, in due course, the Samaritan 
people. So Assyria is not somewhere that uh, any Israelite is going to put at the top of their favorite list. At the greatest extent, this empire that Nineveh ruled, this Assyrian empire, was absolutely enormous in its extent. And if I share my screen with you for a moment, I should be able to show you on a map what I mean by that. Here we are. This is a map showing us the Assyrian Empire. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. We've got those two great waterways, the Euphrates, the Euphrates and the Tigris, running down here into the Persian Gulf. Here's Babylon. Here's Nineveh. And you can see marked in the faint purplish pink here, this enormous empire. It's the whole of what we sometimes call the Fertile Crescent, plus they even took over Egypt, a massive superpower of its day. Yet what we hear from Nahum isn't limited in time and space. It's true there are specifics that go to the uh, Nineveh itself and the Assyrian Empire, but what he's speaking about is something of universal application. As well as referring to Nineveh, the prophet also mentions three other places by name. They appear in verse four, and they are Bashan, Carmel, and Lebanon. And if I scroll down my little visual here, I'll be able to show you again where these places are. Here's modern Israel, look, with the Sea of Galilee here, the Dead Sea here, the River Jordan running down the valley. And here's Bashan, it runs from what we might now call the Golan Heights, north eastwards into Syria. Here's Mount Carmel, where Elijah, of course, confronted the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And biblical Lebanon is centered on Tyre and Sidon, this area here. So that's where we're talking about geographically in chapter one. But in fact, um, in chapter three of his book, Nahum also mentions some other areas. He mentions Egypt's capital, Thebes, and he talks about Egypt's allies, Cush, which is normally associated with Ethiopia, and Put, which is normally associated with an area straddling the Red Sea, what we might now call Somaliland and Lebanon. As to Nahum himself, virtually nothing is known about man apart from what we can tell through reading his book. We're told in verse one that he was an Elkoshite, meaning that he came from a place called Elkosh, and Elkosh means something like God snares. So this is a man snared, trapped, um, taken in by God. He's a prophet, of course, and he is a very skilled wordsmith. He's using in this book some of the three classic devices of Hebrew poetry. So if you look, for example, at verse two, he does that thing of stating a proposition and then expanding on it within the same verse or phrase. The Lord takes vengeance, expand on it. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme sounds, but it does rhyme ideas. So in verse five, we get the earth trembles at his, that's God's presence, the world and all who live in it. And um, Nahum also uses another favorite device of Hebrew poets, which is called acrostics, where you start every single line with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In fact, he starts that way, but he doesn't manage to continue it all the way through. But what we're looking at here is poetry. And because it's poetry, it has to be read like poetry. If we want to go wrong in the reading of the scriptures, one really good way to do it is to fail to appreciate the particular type of language that we're reading. We don't read poetry the way that we read history. We don't read history the way that we read a letter. And we don't read letters the way that we would read straightforward prose. So this is poetry, but it's also prophetic. And in keeping with the prophetic nature of this book, 
we move between sections that relate to Nineveh and those which relate to the Israelite people, parts that foresee the coming Messiah and parts that relate to evil spiritual forces, even Antichrist type of forces. This is the way the prophetic vision works. It telescopes things in time and jumbles sometimes things in place. We need to be aware of that as we're navigating our way through this text. But as we look at it in more detail, we'll find that this chapter conveys deep truths about God's power, God's character, and God's dealings with the nation. Those are the things I want to talk to you about this morning. God's power, God's character, God's dealings with the nations. Nahum confronts us with the raw power of God and underlines his complete command over nature. Verse 5, the mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Verse 6, his wrath is poured out like fire, the rocks are shattered before him. All the elements submit to this great creator God, not just the land, but also the waters. Verse 4, he rebukes the sea and it, it dries up. He makes all the rivers run dry. And not just the waters, but the heavens. Verse 2, his way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and his clouds are the, the clouds are the dust of his feet. However, this prophet isn't just speaking about God's power, but also about God's character and God's actions. What Nahum says helps us understand the framework in which God uses his power. The emotional drivers, if you like, of why he does what he does and how God responds to human choices, both on an individual, a personal level, and also on a corporate, a national level. So next, we're going to look at what this chapter says concerning God's character and how that character translates into dealings with God. The prophet describes characteristics of God that the modern Western world would rather not think about. Verse 1 tells us that this God is jealous and avenging and is filled with wrath. Verse 6 tells us that he feels indignation and fierce anger. Now we have to just pause there for a moment before we go any further down this track because we need to be very careful to understand what words truly mean rather than just what we think they mean or what the world tells us they mean. Jealousy in our society has an overwhelmingly negative connotation today. It's usually associated for us with romantic, especially sexual relationships. But to be jealous, this is the de dictionary de definition, is to be jealous is also to be solicitous or anxiously watchful over honour or rights. In the context of God's dealings with humanity, it conveys God's requirement for exclusive devotion from his people. That requirement for exclusive devotion is hardly too much to ask because look at what God offers in return. In Exodus 15 verse 3, we read for the first time that God shows unfailing love, but it's, that's something that's repeated often throughout the Psalms and the prophets. Not only unfailing love, but we also read in the scriptures of his unfailing kindness. That's in 2 Samuel 22. It's in Psalm 18. I find it strange, you know, how people complain about the idea of God asking to be treated with the respect and honour that are his due. Because we really don't seem to have that same problem when it comes to human dignitaries. We're very ready to give them respect and honour and look up to them. 
God demands no less. Likewise, when we're talking about God's vengeance, we need to look carefully at the meaning of word. To avenge is to vindicate by punishing a wrongdoer. It means exacting satisfaction for an injury, inflicting punishment on account of someone or something. When it's used properly and proportionately, vengeance is an aspect of justice. Now, of course, in human hands, vengeance often strays beyond proper bounds. It becomes excessive retribution. It's an ugly and an, un an unwarranted thing. That's one reason that God tells us to leave the job of vengeance to him. In Romans 12, Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will re repay. There's something else we need to recognize if we are to reach a proper evaluation of who God is and how he acts. The false gods of the pagan world are fronts for evil spirit powers. They are capricious, they are uncaring, and they are cruel. They demand blood sacrifice. They treat human beings as playthings, and they stir up behavior in us that Paul tells us in Galatians 5 belongs to the sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. That is what false gods offer us. The Lord, by contrast, is full of mercy and loving kindness. The fruit of submitting ourselves to his ways and his laws is the very opposite. Again, in Galatians 5, Paul tells us what the, the fruit of being in God's way is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. When our God judges, He acts proportionately and only as a last resort. And so in verse 2, Nahum tells us that God takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. This is not a megalomaniac exercise of unfettered power, but a measured response in the face of repeated and grave provocation. And of course, there is another side to God's character. The counterpoint to his jealousy, vengeance, indignation and wrath is what Nahum sets out for us in verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger. And verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. An echo, by the way, of Psalm 46 verse 1, which Linda unfolded for us last week. As we reflect on these things that tell us about God's character, we need to take part of this. We can lie by speaking outright falsehoods, but we can also lie by telling a half truth or deliberately withholding facts. That's why if you go into a court, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but. If we fail to proclaim who God is in the totality of his being, we are telling a lie. If we play up one side of his nature, but ignore or downplay another, we are lying about who he is, what his character is like. Now, it's in our human nature, of course, that we tend to get things out of kilter. Our minds are too small, and our vision is too limited to be able to hold properly in tension. Those things about God's ways and character and dealing that seem to us to be paradoxical or sometimes even illogical. How do you hold in tension God's love and God's, and God's mercy on the one hand 
and his justice and his holiness on the other. We struggle. Each tradition and each generation tend to have their own particular blind spot. The Victorians went too far, perhaps, in the direction of hellfire and damnation. Our own age does the opposite. We play up the love of God. We want to talk about that all the time, love and mercy, but not the other side of the equation. And we have to be truthful. But these things are all and parcel of who God is and what he does. The fact is, I believe, that many of those who claim to be followers of Christ have been misrepresenting who God is. We failed to put in proper context the things he is doing and why he is doing them. And the result of that has been to leave our people with a false impression of where they stand and how they need to respond to their creator. This is not kindness on our part. It isn't meeting people where they are or being relevant. It's a dereliction of duty and it runs the risk of allowing many to go to eternal damnation who might otherwise have been saved had we been more honest. All of which brings us to God's dealings with the nation. The way in which God uses his power. His actions are an outward, an expression of his character. For his justice and faithfulness demand, as in verse 3 of Nahum's prophecy tells us, that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. And so in verse 8, with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. You know that's exactly what happened. Nineveh was destroyed by forces under the leadership of the Babylonian king Nabopolassar in 612 BC. It was obliterated so completely that there was a time once when people who wanted to debunk the Bible and say it wasn't accurate denied that there had ever been a place called Nineveh. They had to read their words, of course, in the middle of the 19th century, when a British man called Austin Henry Layard excavated those remains. Nahum's prophecy wasn't just correct in outline, it was correct in every detail and every particular. Nineveh was renowned for its strong defences. It had huge, thick walls and a big moat around it. It was designed to withstand a long siege, but that mighty city fell after only a few months of siege because floodwaters from a tributary of the Tigris River swept away a vital section of the ramparts and the invaders broke in. That was the overwhelming flood that Nahum talked about in verse 3. God's prophet saw it all before it happened. Other elements of what was prophesied against Nineveh came to pass too. Her network of alliances and vassal states failed her in her hour of need. Nahum describes it in verse 12. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be cut off and pass away. That enormous empire collapsed virtually overnight. Why? Verse 14 tells us, the Lord has given a command concerning you. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the carved images and cast idols that are in the temples of your God. I will prepare your grave for you are fire. What God decrees will happen and nothing and no one can prevent it. Remember, of course, how forbearing God had been towards Nineveh in the past. He'd sent Jonah to preach there, and the result of that was one of the most successful outreach missions of all time. Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 tells us that the Ninevites believed God, declared a fast, and put on sackcloth. 
verse 10 of the same chapter of Jonah tells us, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But the descendants of those Ninevites who heard and believed God's word through Jonah soon slipped back into their old habits and now their time has run out. Verses 9 and 10 of Nathan chapter 1. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. All well and good, but what does it mean for us here and now, today, in our nation? Nahum means comfort. This prophet brings hope at a time of great trial and hardship. Remember what I told you earlier. He is preaching at a time when Samaria and the northern Israelite kingdom of Israel have been destroyed, had their hearts ripped out by the Assyrians. And he's preaching before God's vengeance upon Nineveh has been shown to the world. It's an in-between time. What is God doing that people must have been crying out? Why, oh why, will he not act? But look at verses 12 and 13 of Nahum chapter 1. Although I have afflicted you, O Lord, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles from your neck. This prophecy that Nahum brings should be a source of comfort for us too. It's a comfort because the destruction of a corrupt and evil regime shows God's power and justice. It's a comfort because the fulfillment of prophecy confirms the reliability of God's character and of his promises. It's a comfort because breaking the stranglehold of an oppressor makes freedom possible for all of us. And it's a comfort because he speaks of restoration and homecoming, a renewal of covenant blessing. We should be greatly encouraged as we read these words. But at the same time, we should take heed of them and take heart of what they say about our own walk with the Lord. As well as a data Datable and verifiable historical reality. What Nahum describes is also timeless. It's part and parcel of that titanic struggle between good and evil, which we see taking place in our own day and our own nation. When he says in verse 11, From you, O Nineveh, has come forth one who plots evil against the Lord and counsels wicked. Almost certainly he's referring to a historical character. I don't know who it was. Maybe it was the Assyrian king or some other person of influence. But he's also picturing for us an archetype of villainy as well. A human being, perhaps, possibly even an evil spirit. But at all events, someone or something that is determined to stand against God and his purposes. It is our job as God's people, to resist evil. We do that by failing to tolerate it. We do that by speaking out against it. And we do that by proclaiming the word and works of God and by manifesting his kingdom. God's riposte to the challenge of evil is met ultimately in Christ Jesus. Nahum anticipates the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of the Jewish people to their homeland. Verse 15, look there on the mountain, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. That messianic age of peace and restoration is coming soon. But in the meantime, there is work for us to do. 
our nation has turned away from God and is presently hurtling towards judgment. Jesus, when he walked this earth, said, Matthew 12, verse 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. If there is to be any hope for our land, it can only come through repenting and turning back to our Creator. The vast majority of our fellow countrymen and fellow countrywomen presently have little idea about who he is and what he requires of human life. Paul in Romans 10 said, how then can they call on the one they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We need to speak boldly of our God, of his power, describing the fullness of his hand and explaining what he is doing in the earth in our day and why. Nahum 5 tells us the earth trembles at his presence. But verse 3 reminds us he is slow to anger. And verse 7 tells us he is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. All praise to his holy name. Amen. Thank you, Philip, for that uh, word this morning. And now we're going to uh, together make a declaration of our faith. Jesus calls each of us individually, just as he called his first disciples. And yet those disciples were called into community. So we are called as a community the body of Christ, the church, to live out our faith together. As we declare our faith, we speak as individuals, but also as a body together, united with all true believers around the globe and across the centuries. So let's make a declaration of our faith using the Apostles' Creed in question and answer. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I believe David is going to lead us in our prayers. Thank you. Psalm 100 verse 4 reads, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Lord, we praise you for who you are, that you are the sovereign God over all. And we thank you for all that you have given us in the past, that you are all that you are doing at the moment and for all that you will do, Lord. 
in Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, he asks us, he tells us that we are to pray for those in authority. And Lord, we want to pray now that you would have your hand in mercy on the leaders of the church in this country. Lord, whether they are titular leaders, like the Archbishops of Canterbury and York and all the other denominations, or the leaders of your Ecclesia. Lord, we pray that you would set the agenda for all churches, that they would not be following man's programs, but your leading. That you would use this coronavirus that we have to be creating the ecclesia of your choice, so that truly we would be the body for this country that our country so desperately needs. And Lord, even now we make mention of the Anglican Communion's Lambeth Conference later this year, praying that you and you alone would be setting the agenda of it and defining the outcome of it. I think everyone here will be aware of the little local difficulties in which the Prime Minister is finding himself. Lord, we pray that Boris Johnson would remain as Prime Minister for each one of the days that you have ordained for him. Not one more and not one less. Lord, you ordained him to be Prime Minister for a purpose. Lord, let him fulfil that purpose as you understand it. Lord, we pray for the necessary changes that there need to be in government, in terms of policy, in terms of priorities, in terms of personnel. Lord, we are asking you to demonstrate your sovereignty in that regard. And now I'd like to pray for the different political parties Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, Unionists in Ireland, SNP, and there probably are a few others, but those are the main ones. And I'd like you all now silently to pray for whichever party you voted for in the last election, for God's way forward and for God's direction for them. In Luke 18, in the parable of the persistent widow in the first eight verses, Jesus at the end of verse eight says, nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And Lord, we want to pray that here in the West, that we would manifest the persistent faith the travailing in prayer, the commitment to you and to you alone. And we will be willing to pay the price for that faith. Lord, would you guide us as we now pray amongst ourselves for such faith? Whether you want to pray for yourselves or if your local uh, churches, ecclesia, whatever, can you please pray amongst yourselves for such manifestation of, of real faith?
there are two countries I'd now like us very specifically to pray for. The Ukraine and Taiwan. And we think of Psalm 46. Lord, we pray that you would be their strength and their refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. Lord, both countries are in a tight spot between a rock and a hard place. But Lord, would you protect them? Would you cause many in both countries and indeed around the world to pray in persevering, prevailing prayer and intercession that you would demonstrate your power and your glory in ways that man cannot understand. And now I'd just like briefly to commit to us all to pray for whichever country the Lord lays on your heart and to pray for a short while for integrity in public life, whether in the church, in government, in the marketplace, and for a short period as the Lord leads in those countries. Lord, we want to thank you that you are a God, indeed the God, who answers prayer when we call upon you. Thank you, Lord, that you have heard our prayers and that you will continue to answer them on an ongoing basis. Lord, in your mercy, we commit these prayers and this time to you. Amen. Amen. Continue. In an attitude of prayer as we want to bring those that are on our hearts those who are struggling those who are ill who need god's hand and we read in isaiah 53 verse 5 but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed so we want to pray for healing now for those that we know are in need of God's touch. And uh, when it comes to the time, if you have a name or a family or a situation you want to bring before the Lord, just unmute yourself and speak their name out. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, David, for leading us in those prayers of intercession, and thank you all uh, for your participation. And now we're going to ask Jane to lead us again in praise. Thank you. Oh, Lord, in all the 
Yeah. 